Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. We begin today with a long-running ag research project on drip irrigation. SUNUP's Curtis Hare caught up with our irrigation specialist for some background and some results that you may want to consider in your own field. The evaluation that we are conducting here is a uh, classic uh, comprehensive evaluation of uh, subsurface drip irrigation systems. And what we do is we come to the field, we find where the drip lines are located, we randomly select some drip lines, and then we dig up the emitters, a uh, few emitters on each line. Uh, there's a minimum number to make sure it's a statistically representative. Uh, so once we dig up all the emitters, uh, then we use catch cans. Uh, we collect the amount of water that's uh, being discharged from each emitter and then we, uh, once we collect all those numbers, um, we um, estimate the average, uh, the variation, um, the differences. We do some statistical analysis. This SDI or subsurface drip irrigation system was installed nine years ago. The main purpose of the evaluation is to determine whether the emitters are distributing equal amounts of water. Uh, most of the times you see that some of the emitters are clogged, or as you move toward the end of it, the discharge gets smaller and smaller, things like that. So, so that's really the comprehensive way to do it. This type of evaluation is for research purposes only. The risk of damage to the irrigation system is high and it's extremely labor intensive. For growers, what we recommend is to use uh, signs in the crop growth, um, crop biomass. That's the first indicator. Uh, that would tell you there's some issues going on. And then after that, the two, the two things that they should always check is the system pressure and system flow rate. Um, so with system pressure, uh, we always have um, like Schrader valves or other ports um, on the main lines, uh, the control valves, and also at the end of the uh, system on the uh, um, downstream end of the system where people can come check the pressures uh, with the flow rate, like any other irrigation system, we want people to have flow meters, uh, look at the flow meters, and the combination of flow rate and pressure would tell people a lot. While SDIs are typically more expensive than other irrigation systems, they do have a lot more advantages. Soleil says the main advantage is the loss of water due to evaporation or runoff is extremely minimal. The tapes, drip lines, drip tapes are usually between 12 to 18 inches below the soil surface. So um, you're applying water exactly where the roots are. And you're spoon feeding the water to the roots. And by, by doing that, you minimize any losses. Plus, most of the time, you have the topsoil or in between the drip lines uh, dry enough that if you capture any rainfall, you can use all that rainfall um, for um, for meeting crop requirements. So it's a 100% efficient use of rainfall and irrigation water. Users should really evaluate their systems um, once or twice a year, maybe at the beginning of the season and then at the end of the season uh, to make sure that there are no issues and if there are some issues starting to develop, they could fix it uh, when it's easiest to fix and it's least expensive to fix those issues. I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet weather report. Our switch to wetter, cooler conditions is a real switch here in mid-August. While our weather patterns often shift across the whole state, Tuesday gave us an example of how variable we can be within our state. The Mesonet Cattle Comfort Index is a monitor of what it feels like for cattle outdoors. Tuesday afternoon at 420, cattle comfort conditions across the state range from 77 to 115 a jump from no stress to severe heat stress. Growers getting ready to plant wheat have been checking four-inch bare soil temperatures. The three-day average for Sunday through Tuesday, August 10th, showed that a lot of locations had averages of 85 or above. These high soil temperatures can inhibit the germination of heat-sensitive wheat varieties. Cooler temperatures and rain will help reduce early wheat planting worries. 
Lots of variation in weather across the state gives us a lot of variation in the water we need to supply our plants. An evapotranspiration map from Tuesday showed variation from 1,300 inches of water demand to 2,700 inches. Checking evapotranspiration for your location will help you know how much water your plants need. Here's Gary with a check on drought and likely weather conditions for fall. Thanks, Alan. Good morning, everyone. Let's take a look at that latest drought monitor map and see what we have. Now, we have had some relief up north in northern Oklahoma. We've shrunk that moderate drought, but we've seen an expansion of the moderate and even severe drought down across uh, the southern parts of, uh, of Oklahoma, uh, really in thanks to a lack of precipitation, but also due to those extreme temperatures we've seen over the last uh, 30 to 60 days, a lot of above normal temperatures. Now, the good news is uh, not only will we cool down for this weekend, but it looks like much of next week also looks to be favorable for more mild weather across Oklahoma. So this is for the, basically most of next week. We see increased odds of above normal precipitation and also increased odds of near normal or even below normal temperatures. So that heat dome has been vanquished, at least for the time being. Now let's go out even further. Even though we don't have much of a signal for precipitation, we do see increased odds for above normal temperatures for the August through October time frame. So while we have a cool down currently, that doesn't mean that we're done with summer by any stretch of the imagination. So we cooled down, we got some rain, summer will come back, it's still early August, uh, but for now we should enjoy and let's quench some of that drought. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Now to another quick overview on summer crops with Josh Lofton. This week, we're talking sesame. Today we're going to continue our series on summer crop and we're going to take a look of one that's, that's uh, very unique for the state. Some folks it might be very new crop but it's actually not a new crop as far as a, a global production and that's sesame similar to soybeans it is an oil seed production uh, production system so it's it's not it's not like uh, corn or grain sorghum and, and having that grain or that grass production system but but we actually want the oil high oil crop uh, really high oil per seed on the sesame crop which makes it a very unique crop for a lot of our our varying cultural cuisine and that's where we need a lot of the oil unlike a lot of our other crops though is that there's a lot of challenges to production and that's because there's one there's, there's a lot of things that we don't know quite yet. And two, there's a lot of things that are not, uh, quote, on label uh, for the production system. So it's a little more challenging to get that sesame crop up and growing. But when you get it up and growing and close that canopy, uh, the sesame can really take off and just be a good growing crop for you. The benefit of sesame is that there are not a whole lot of diseases nor insects that even care to mess with sesame. It's a little bit of a challenging crop form. Maybe they're unique to it and they're, they're growing on it and maybe they'll get here in, in the future. But as of right now, we don't have a lot of insecticides and we don't have a lot of fungicides uh, labeled for sesame, but that's okay because most of the time we don't need them. Uh, we, we have very low pest pressure from both a disease and an insect standpoint for the sesame crop. The other thing that we see with sesame is that the benefit on double crop production is really high. It can be planted in that mid-June, late June, 1st of July, using Mother Nature to help mature out the crop and can do very well where some of our other crops start to lose yield as soon as we get into the month of July. Sesame can still have the potential to do very well. So it's, it's, it's a great fit within the state. We have a great market through Sesico and a great seed supplier. So overall, it's a good fit as long as we can find those production management or, or you're not worried about doing a little bit of trial and error, especially when it comes to weed management and harvesting to make sure that you got a good crop. Of course, the Olympics are going on in Brazil, but Daryl, that's not the only big news coming from Brazil right now. 
USDA announced last week that Brazil was approved once again to export fresh and frozen beef to the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, this hasn't been, you know, the, Br Brazil has not had this uh, access for quite a number of years. They've been importing, uh, or we've been importing some cooked product from them. Um, but, you know, they, I've heard some questions, some concerns about producers. Is this going to be a major market uh, factor? And, and the short answer really is no, it's probably not. Uh, Brazil will import fresh and frozen beef uh, under the other countries' uh, tariff rate quota, uh, which is a relatively small part of the, the quota. The total imports allowed less than 10 percent, and Brazil will have to share that with other countries like Nicaragua and so on. So the short answer is it's a very limited quantity they will have uh, available to come in in the short run. It will grow over time potentially, uh, but it's not really a major market factor, not one we need to be uh, terribly concerned about in the short run. So why, why, why is the uh, USDA allowing Brazilian beef to come back in? Well, on the, in terms of our restrictions on fresh beef from Brazil, it was related to foot and mouth disease. So okay. it's taken a long time for Brazil to get to the point where they have it under control to a point that USDA is satisfied with that and allows those fresh and frozen beef imports. Okay, now we're, we're, we're in the middle of August right now. Let's look at, at, the, at the beef and cattle numbers right now. Well, you know, we're in midsummer again, kind of coming through the doldrums. Uh, it looks like the market has put in a low. Both feeder and fed cattle markets have actually shown some strength lately. Um, you know, on the fed cattle side, again, we've moved past the seasonal peaks in June in terms of cattle slaughter and beef production. Feedlots continue to appear to be very current. Uh, carcass weights are down year over year. So we're really, uh, you know, kind of moving into the fall now. We've, we've obviously got some demand here for uh, Labor Day, uh, the last big grilling holiday of the, of the year. So uh, markets look like they've put in a bottom and feeder cattle markets have also strengthened here recently as well. As we do move into fall, they're going to be planting wheat across Oklahoma. What's what's the uh, projected pasture look like? Well, in terms of physical conditions, of course, we just have to kind of wait and see. Right. I mean, we have you know generally adequate moisture, I think, but certainly we'll need some more for good wheat pasture. On the market side, one of the things that's developed here in the last month or so in terms of feeder cattle prices is a little bit of a break or a flat spot in that price to weight line. And, it, and it's a dynamic situation, one that needs to be monitored. But right now, today, if you look at the prices, you'd have to say that it would favor purchasing maybe a little bit heavier stocker than we typically do. There's not a real good return in the first hundred pounds of gain from about a 450 pound animal right now, uh, but, the, uh, but from 550 pounds up, the, the uh, returns, the value of gain, if you will, is much better. So uh, it's not a clear cut thing that that will continue into the fall, but certainly something that producers should monitor as we go into the fall. Okay, thank you much. Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. All cow-calf producers are interested in doing what they can to keep uh, costs down in order to improve their bottom line. And one of the chief areas that uh, everybody works at in efforts to try to reduce expenses is in that winter feed bill. One of the ways that we here in Oklahoma can do that is by stockpiling Bermuda grass and allowing the cow to be the harvesting agent of that Bermuda grass in late fall and early winter time. What the concept of stockpiling Bermuda grass consists of, first of all, is making sure before the end of August we get the uh, Bermuda grass field mowed, hayed, or grazed down pretty close. Then apply about 50 pounds of actual N per acre. Stay off of that particular uh, field of Bermuda grass until uh, around the 1st of November. With some fall rains, we should expect on the low end about a thousand pounds of dry matter being produced per acre. On a good year, a full ton of dry matter Bermuda grass being available then when we start to, to graze that. As we turn the cows back into that Bermuda grass in November, We'd suggest that you consider strip grazing, somehow control the grazing so that they don't waste a lot of that forage. You'll get better utilization uh, out of the expenses and the effort that you put into this concept of, of stockpiling Bermuda grass. You may want to go ahead and do some supplementation with these cows starting around the first part of December. Something in the neighborhood of a couple of pounds per head per day of a 14 to 25 percent crude protein supplement. Now, I would encourage you to go to the SunUp website, 
That's sunup.okstate.edu. Look under show links. And uh, there's a link to the 2001 research reports where you can look and learn more about how these cows were handled and some of the results that they had with the different levels of supplementation of the stockpiled Bermuda grass. One of the amazing things about this concept is how well this Bermuda grass, even after frost, would hold its protein content. In uh, November, it was still running something like, uh, oh gosh, 13, 14% crude protein. It dropped down a, a full 1 to 2% in December, but in January, still holding up there in the neighborhood of about 10 to 11% crude protein. So this is the time that you'd want to be utilizing that forage if you have wheat pasture coming on or fescue in the eastern part of the state, go ahead and use the stockpiled Bermuda grass first and then the cool season grasses later in the winter time. One more additional thought uh, as we are having those cows out on this frozen Bermuda grass is to make sure that there's a mineral package available. Something that's a 6 to 9% uh, phosphorus mineral that's, that has some vitamin A added to it. That'll help uh, meet some of those additional needs that these cows were not getting out of that uh, stockpiled Bermuda grass. I think if you'll really learn and consider this concept of use, utilizing stockpiled Bermuda grass as a way of helping meet your winter nutrition requirements during the first part of the winter, we can cut those winter feed costs rather dramatically. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow-Calf Corner. This week in Vet Scripts, we hear from Dr. Barry Whitworth about blackleg in cattle. While I was in practice, I can't remember a summer that somebody doesn't call me with this, with the conversation that goes something like this. I just lost my best heifer calf or my best steer calf, and he was fine yesterday. And after some more conversation and going and examining the animal, most of the time we would find out that the animal had contracted blackleg. Now blackleg is caused by an organism called Clostridium chauvinii. And this organism is readily available in the, in the soil and it's easy for animals to pick up when they're grazing and they ingest it and, it and it locates in the liver, spleen, or the gastrointestinal tract. And then when we have some type of bruising or injury issue, these spores will then mobilize to that area and then you'll get the infection started and these animals and these spores release toxins which in inevitably kill this animal. Now treatment for this is very unrewarding. Most of these animals will be found dead or if you catch them really early they may be down or show lameness but they are very difficult to treat. Prevention is much easier. And prevention is easy. All we need to do is make sure these animals receive a vaccine sometime between 60 and 90 days and repeat that at four to six weeks. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist, joins us now. Kim, let's first talk about canola today. Last week you mentioned the early July price. What was the June price? Well, if you look at June prices, and that's when the canola was harvested, was early to mid-June. Came into June on the, on the 1st of June, the canola price in Oklahoma, you're looking at an average of about 12 ele elevators across the state, was $6.76 for a 50-pound bushel. On uh, June the 9th, it had peaked out at $7.10 a bushel. By July 1, it had fell to uh, $6.19. August the 1, it was down to five twenty-three, and just uh, today, it's at $5.25 a bushel. <clears throat> you look at the basis off that uh, ICE July futures contract in uh, Canada, is about $4.81 underneath that ICE futures contract. Of course, producers making a lot of planting decisions right now. How is canola looking for 2017 pricing? Well, it's, a, it's tough to get a uh, 2017 price for canola or wheat or any other commodity. One way you can do it is you can look at the futures contract. That ICE contract, of course, is a Canadian contract. It's in uh, in uh, 
a metric tons uh, and uh, and priced uh, that way and that's four hundred and eighty three dollars and eighty cents for a July 17 ice futures contract now if you look at the average basis in June of that ice 16 contract to the Oklahoma cash price that at, that basis averaged a minus four dollars and eighty one cents so if we use that to get uh, estimate our kind of Kentucky windage, the starting point for next year's canola price, it'd be $6.15 a bushel. Now, can you apply some of those same calculations to wheat for 2017? You bet uh, You bet you can. Now, we do have a forward contract basis for wheat, and that helps us out with the basis, uh, which we didn't have for canola. You look at July 17 for wheat, uh, that contract's around $4.75. Right now, you can forward contract wheat in most places at, around Oklahoma for $0.95 cents less than that, and that gives you a forward contract price of about $3.80 a bushel, three eighty one right in there. If you look at the average June 16 basis, like we did for canola, it was a minus 78 cents under the July 16 contract price. Apply that to your your 17 contract and you get $3.97 or $4 for your wheat. So I'd probably be using around say six and a quarter for canola and I'd probably be using around $4 for wheat. Budgeting it out looking for that 17, what I'm, I'm going to plant and harvest in 17. Okay, a couple other quick questions. Uh, a lot of wheat in the bin. What's it going to take to get prices moving up? And then with all this in mind, strategy. Well, if you look at uh, wheat in the bin, like you said, there's a lot there. I think uh, producers, if they've got it and they're going to hold it, they need to put it under that uh, marketing loan so that they can get their 315, 316 out of it. Gives them nine months for the price to come up. What's going to uh, happen to get that price up is we've got to lose a foreign crop. More than one, because we're we've lost France. France's uh, crop, I think that stock our prices from from uh, sliding we really need to lose Argentina and Australia Australia is building storage right now in, in anticipation of a record crop okay Kim thanks a lot we'll see you next week finally today as a new class of the Oklahoma Ag Leadership Program gets underway this fall we're headed to Vietnam where the previous class visited earlier this year OLP program is, is a two-year program and we spend really the first part of it in familiarizing people with our students with uh, Oklahoma agriculture and the political process in the state of Oklahoma and in Washington DC and then we finally culminate it with an international trip which you know Vietnam is a neat place to think about it's one of the rising powers of, of Asia and a major trade partner with us and obviously the big thing in our history and trying to understand the culture in an agriculture cultural nation in Asia uh, and what they face and their production practices is uh, really a mind-opening experience. We don't grow everything in Oklahoma. Um, there's lots of other crops being grown and we need to see how um, the different methods that are used, the different crops that are grown, the different policies that other producers are challenged by, and really it's that challenge portion. I think that we are all asked to expand ourselves personally and try to grow as much as possible. And one of the things the program is very instrumental in doing is exposing them to all aspects of agriculture, not only the cropping system, but the marketing system, the economics, the political system, and how that all ties together um, for agriculture as a whole. Vietnam, it, it was very interesting to see how those people live and their daily activities, uh, especially on the farmer side of it. You know, they're, they're dealing with two to four acres as the average farm size. So, you know, that to me was pretty amazing how they still make a living and and they have the same issues as we have here that, you know, they go out and they have to go into towns and find another job to make their farm system work. You know, I have always used the term, it's, it's a matter of perspective. And you broaden your perspective a great deal when you come into a very different culture, a whole different setting, and obviously the way they produce and raise rice here is totally different than anything you find in Oklahoma. Rice is such an important staple commodity for people all around the world, especially in southeastern Asia. Um, you hear different numbers, but anywhere from 50 to 75 percent of the 
people in the world depend upon rice for their staple food. Erie, the International Rice Research Institute, they are developing a product called Golden Rice and it does have a golden color to it. Um, it's not only in the name but it also looks that way. And what they are doing is incorporating beta carotene into the rice and rice isn't doesn't have a whole lot of nutrition in and of itself and so they're trying to incorporate this essentially vitamin A um, to help prevent deaths in young children. Just opens your, uh, your mind to all different types of things going on in the world. Uh, also it, it gets you more involved in your community and also uh, get you more interested in politics and things like that. I was never interested in politics and the issues going on, but now I see how there's so little of us out there in agriculture and we need to be current on the issues facing us today. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity and the energy and the experience I've had with class 17 is not something I'm soon to forget and our time in this country as well as our time in this program has made a lasting impact on me and I'll carry it with me forever. A special thanks to our colleague Craig Woods who traveled with the group to Vietnam to document their trip. And best of luck to the new class of OALP as they get started this fall. And that'll do it for us this week. I'm Lyndall Stout, and we'll see you next time at SUNUP.